Okay, I believe we now have the full panel. Is everyone connected and ready to go? Brilliant. I will then hand over to Shane as our host for panel three of this conference. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ralph. And thank you to everyone on the organizing committee for putting this together. I haven't been able to attend every panel so far today. I've had other weekend parental things to, to manage, but I've, I've watched the videos and it's, it's, it's incredible. It's a fantastic diversity of speakers globally on topics and just, I find it wonderfully, wonderfully stimulating. So I'd like to begin by, by, by thanking the organizing committee, um, Ralph, Lisa, Eleanor and everyone on it. And I know I haven't <laughs> mentioned everyone by name, but thank the entire organizing committee for this. It has been absolutely fantastic. And to thank all the speakers on the four panels, but specifically, I suppose, uh, the speakers on panel three. So what I'll do is I'll begin by introducing the speakers. So their names and their topics and the titles of their presentations. And then I will open the floor to questions, comments, feedback, anything that people may have. Um, I should mention that uh, you can simply raise your hand physically if you want to, you can raise it electronically or you can ask questions in the chat function. I will try to make sure I keep an eye on all of those various different aspects. But uh, yeah, so we'll I'll begin by introducing the speakers. A second. Okay, so for panel three <clears throat> today, we have Aidan Pauling, uh, the 49th life, Washington as a noble Greek and Roman. Anika T. Prather, T. Prather, living in the constellation of the canon, the lived experience of African-American students reading classical classic literature. Sarah Christine Teets, can antiquity help us unlearn white supremacy in the United States? Zoe Meros, playing into the past, experiencing American football stadiums through an ancient lens. Alexandra Medera, Medera prehistoric Greeks in South America and other bad scholarship on the Orphic Argonautica. Marie-Louise Reinhardt, Authenticity of Johann Matthias Gesner's uh, Dialectical Ideas, an approach to examine professionalism during an 18th century crisis in Latin pedagogy. Catherine Murphy, What's in a Main? The Transhistorical Use of Large Cats for Personal Advancement. And George Prekas, Pestilential Stars, Astrologers on Plagues Through the Ages. But before I open it to general discussion, I might take the opportunity to uh, mention something that's perhaps is topical at the moment, which is the threat to classics at Howard University. And perhaps, uh, which recent threat, but as I understand it as well, one that was voiced perhaps 10 years ago too, if I remember correctly, reading about this in the media about 10 years ago. And a threat that we have seen in departments in Ireland as well, where at least one department out of Queen's University Belfast has been amalgamated about 20, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, was amalgamated into other departments in the university. And the same threat has been voiced towards other Irish classic departments during the last decade or 15 years or so. So I might ask uh, Anike if you want to perhaps just open by giving us an update on the situation and what we can do to support you and help um, the study of classics in America and in Howard University specifically. Thank you, Thank you um, so much uh, for opening this opportunity. Um, I think the petition is still going on and people are still able to sign. I constantly share it on my Twitter page. Um, oh, good. Thank you. And there's, there's the link and you can sign there. Um, the, the power of that is thousands of signatures have already been collected and it was very influential in at least opening up an opportunity for the leadership to talk about it. Um, so you're right, Shane, um, the classics department at Howard has been, um, there has been a battle over that classics department for some time. Like even when I, this was my first year at Howard, I knew, you know, coming in that that was a constant um, shadow, you know, <laughs> in the background. But um, I still was just glad it was still hanging on and I was excited to be able to be a part of it in any small way. I'm part-time um, there adjunct, but, and I love it. Um, I teach uh, Humanities One course called Blacks and Classical Studies, which shows the intersection of classics with uh, Black people, starting with ancient African civilizations and how they're discussed in the works of Herodotus and other ancient historians, all the way up through sl in, uh, um, slavery, and civil rights and activism, um, 
re reconstruction, just showing how the classics have been a part of our heritage just as much as anybody else's. Um, and that's been a powerful journey to take with, you know, through two semesters. Um, and so where we are right now is um, I know that students signed the petition. There was a major outpouring of support within the general student body. Um, I was excited to see that even departments that had nothing to do with classics were talking about how upset they were. Uh, a student wrote a beautiful letter who was an engineering major proving why classics is important, important to those in the STEM fields. And the way she broke that down uh, was amazing. I think I'll probably even, I will be willing to share it with uh, those who organize this conference and you can circulate it to those who participate in it. I think it will be something you could see as someone outside of classics because STEM seems to be constantly competing. I think that's going along, going on in a lot of universities worldwide. I'm realizing worldwide that there's a thinking that STEM needs to be focused on, but they don't realize they go hand in hand and one supports the other. And she, she really breaks that down in her letter. And that went into, um, went to the leadership as well. And, um, and where we are right now is the little bit I can say is there's just a conversation finally happening, a meaningful conversation that I know there's no promises or guarantees. Uh, we're very careful, but um, at least they're willing to discuss it. Um, and because at first they weren't discussing, it was like a, a decision that was, you know, finalized. So we'll see what happens. I think there's a shock at how much, I'm gonna say this last point, of how much, especially African-American students, students of color value classics. I don't think people, I think that was underestimated um, because of the outrage. I mean, they were just really visibly upset and they took it to social media and were able to articulate why this is so important. And with all that's going on about classics being irrelevant to people, it's, you know, we need to look at other things uh, because these are like a bunch of dead white men. This is not for us, for people, especially people of color to see an actual HBCU, the students, not the faculty. The faculty did not create the petition. The, the students started the petition and the faculty has just shared it because they made it public. So we've just retweeted it <laughs> and just, you know, added a few little quotes with our retweets and sharing and, um, and that, and so the students are driving it. Um, it was a student organization that wrote a big like tweet that really got the fire going. And this student organization is in Africana studies. It's not even in classics, right? So if they're irrelevant, to people of color or diverse populations. Why is a student organization in Africana studies talking about, please, let's try to save our beloved classics department. And then that petition was given to that organization by two other students who were taking um, some classics courses. And, um, and, and so that response of the student body, that is a reflection of the power of the faculty of the classics department. And I'm not even necessarily, I'm gonna say this last thing, I'll promise I'll be quiet. Um, it's not even a reflection of me because I just got there and I'm part-time. I've done my best. I've shared the history of Vera Connection, but these students who are outraged have been there for, ye for you know, all th three to four years. A lot of these students are getting ready to graduate or, you know, and so those are the ones carrying on this torch which then now reflects the beauty of the classics department and showing us a new way of thinking about society and humanity and our connectedness to the point where its students are telling the leadership, you are making a big mistake to do something like this. So I almost feel like it debunks the whole battle right now, but I'm just saying, but to me, I think it's pretty clear evidence that people are thinking wrong about classics. And the final thing is that the, 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 the faculty at Howard doesn't make it black. I teach my class is one class, but they're very purist. It's a purely classics department. They learn Latin, Greek. They learn the myths. They learn philosophy. They go deep into the pure study of classics. And all of the professors have degrees in classics and are well known in the classics field. So it's just a, it's a beautiful thing to see. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that 
we'll be able to save the department. Yeah, we all agree. And uh, just note that uh, Lisa has mentioned the, the the link for the discussion on Twitter and also the link for the petition has been added to the chat function. So Thank please you. Thank you so much. If you want to join this and to sign. And I, I wasn't aware that this was to be done by the students, but that's that's a fantastic uh, yeah, representation of the strength of the, the yes. department and the discipline of Howard University yes. as well. Yeah. That, it was, that it elicits that response within the student body. Yes, all across disciplines. That's the other thing that's mm -hmm. beautiful because Howard, you have to take classics. I, had, I went to Howard, so I had to take some classics courses. So you have to take a few to graduate. That's how beautiful it is, you know? It's, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and there, there's strengths with a lot of smaller departments, you know, working together and interacting with each other, and as, as we can see here. Yeah. Okay, so can I take the opportunity to open the floor to uh, discussion? Either, uh, yeah, if anyone has specific questions for any of the speakers, general comments from the panel as a whole, or would like to discuss further the situation at Harvard, at Howard, sorry, please let me know. I want to begin. Hey everyone, I might just um, kick it off just following from what Anika um, Prath was talking about and relating it to um, Sarah Teets, your fantastic um, video as well. Both of you spoke about um, your students' reactions when um, you were addressing these issues and talking about um, critical race theory in your classes. And I'm wondering, um, based on both of your videos and maybe what you have heard from both of your videos are, were your students coming with very similar, um, giving you very similar responses or, or reactions in terms of um, how they feel about the past? And Anika, you were talking about how your students were saying how, oh my gosh, I can, I can relate to the past. Like they're going through what we're going through right now. I'm wondering, Sarah, did you also see that with a lot of your, your students that were actually finding that connection, finding their voice within the ancient texts. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Catherine. Um, so I definitely had a lot of students who had come into my class and their only experience with studying history, like in their high schools, mm. was the kind of class where you just had to memorize a bunch of yeah. names and dates and regurgitate it. And yes. a lot of them absolutely hated <laughs> those history classes. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them would say that, um, they never really thought of people in the past as people, um, that it was something just sort of separate and removed. Um, and you have these sort of, you know, great famous men put up on pedestals, the ones you're told to think are important. Um, but they had never really thought of um, people as having the same kinds of human experiences, human needs, human um, weaknesses. And so um, we would talk about questions like, like did Mark Antony have like an alcohol problem or something like that? Um, and so, you know, thinking about issues of like addiction and suicide that are, you know, very real in, um, in antiquity um, and, and people can relate to, you know, thinking about things like that. And it really just sort of humanized um, these, these people in the past that we were looking at. And they, mine is the same, Sarah, and I'm like really excited to meet you and that you live so close, but that's a whole other story. Um, same thing, they were, it's almost like jaw dropping. They come in because they do K-12 education. And this is really, I'm, this is a sensitive topic for me because I'm in K-12 education. So I'm half the day in K-12 and half the day at Howard University. And they um, are so astonished of how much they were not seeing in their K-12 history classes. Um, so much that was not taught. Um, a, a good example is when I taught about Herodotus and, and I used some of the works of um, For Color Prejudice is another one of his books, but he looks at race uh, in antiquity and just how different it is than what we experience here in America. And, um, and we just, I, we went through the work of Herodotus and one of the students was like, I've read this text so many times in high school and I never knew, I never knew Africa was in this text. 
And we looked at the work, you know, where, where Herodotus talks about the long lived and beautiful Ethiopians, you know, and the describing of their dark skin and their woolly hair and, but how they were described as a beautiful, powerful, almost magical people. And so the other thing that they were touched by, like really emotionally kind of shaken by is to see a Greek person, which they only see as a white person, which they equate with racism, um, saying that my people are beautiful. The people from my continent are beautiful. And that was very healing, right? Because we live in this really divided society, Blacks against whites, Blacks assuming anyone with the light skin is racist. And But, but we realized, he realized that this is kind of a new th way of thinking about our human relationships. When he's going into these ancient texts, there's just another perspective. Not that there's no slavery, which there is, but the fact that Herodotus can leave Greece and travel around to the different continents and talk in a favorable manner about people who don't look like him was just something they had never experienced and was very um, upsetting in a good way to them. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I have to get used to muting and unmuting. I have uh, two questions from Miguel in the, the chat function. First, uh, there's one for you, Anika, so we might begin with that since, since okay. you are on topic. And the second is Thank for uh, Alexandra on the Ar Orphic Argonautica. Uh, I'm so, so excited, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, okay, so I'll begin. Uh, so I was recently reading the Suda, and in one entry, the text clearly states that Memnon was mm -hmm. not, quote, from Ethiopia, i.e. Mm. dark skin. Do students often identify with this particular hero, given his supposedly African heritage, perhaps the most notable in Greek myths? Yes, and I just did a podcast, uh, not a, po a radio interview about this, um, comparing Memnon with uh, a story called um, The People Could Fly by Virginia Hamilton. Um, one thing we come to learn, realize too in this journey, I've kind of realized in this journey, a lot of Black folk tales are rooted in classics. You can just see some similarities there. Um, and so even though I have not taught that in my class, um, in discussing this with another prof classics professor, um, in, the, in, in typically in K-12, before they come to college, this is not highlighted. And it's not that you want to favor it, but when we're teaching, and that's why I was really drawn to Sarah's lecture, that is a form of, a, a way of doing anti-racist teaching <laughs> would be when you get to these texts and these things are mentioned to just say, hey, look, here's a diverse person. Hey, look, here's a map. This is where this is happening. So that it gets, I mean, that's really simple. You don't even have to take a special class on that. You know, it's not, you just teach what's in the text. Um, so yeah, they, and they get really excited when they see it. And then they get really angry that their teachers before us did not take the time to show them that. Excellent. Um, and Miguel's other question was for, uh, I assume for Alexandra, it's on the Orphic Agonautica anyway. Um, regarding the Orphic Agonautica, one of the most interesting aspects of it is the way in which it makes Orpheus the hero. As such, it presents a unique version of the whole plot. In your opinion, do you think it could be interesting to present this version alongside with Apollonius of Rhodes, Rhodes's Argonautica, and let students uh, dis discuss, I suppose, dissect on how they provide curiously different versions of one same mythological world? Uh, so thank you so much for this question. I'm really excited yeah. to be able to talk about the Orphic Argonautica because when I usually talk about it with other classes, they have this completely blank expression because they've probably never heard of it before. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely, um, I believe that there is a lot that could be gained from discussing both versions um, together because they really do tell the same story. It's just that the accents are different. So in the Orphic Agonautica, Orpheus is the main hero, uh, whereas in Apollonius's Argonautica, Orpheus, yes, he is a character and he does some important things but he really isn't the focus. Uh, now, this is something that I've mentioned a little bit in my talk. It would be very difficult in practice though to do this with students because there is a lot of material about Apollonius's Argonautica. It's been kind of popular, I guess, in the last couple of decades. 
Um, for the Orphic Agonautica, though, I have taught one single class about this. And we, we very quickly realized that the big problem was that we don't even have a serviceable English translation. And so we were talking about finer points, um, analyzing the text, and we realized that, well, the translation we're using is translating it wrongly, so our, our assumptions are wrong. Um, so what first needs to be done is we need some scholarship on the Orphic Agonautica, and then we can really start comparing and contrasting. And there's definitely a lot that we can gain from it. So my thesis is partly on that. It is on how the Orphic Agonautica uh, rewrites the Argonautica by Apollonius, which was composed much earlier, probably, but it pretends like it's the original source for that. So the author is being kind of cheeky there. Uh, can I also take this opportunity to ask a question? Um, so I wanted to ask something of Catherine, actually. Uh, so you discussed the um, use of large animals by politicians in the Roman Empire. And there was this one letter by Cicero which said, well, these wild cats, they're, they're so few and far between. And I was just wondering if in antiquity there was any discourse on um, overhunting and how what people did to the environment was causing harm. So I know there was a story, it was about a plant, I think it's called Silphium, which was so rare and valuable that people used it so much that it eventually disappeared. And I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you, Alexandra. Yeah, this is this is really, really interesting. And I um, I love these kind of questions, particularly now that I'm really working in, in conservation and anything to do with anthropogenic activity like deforestation, overhunting, and um, you know, various kinds of exploitation is um, we're already seeing species depletion nowadays. And that is a theme that we really start to see, particularly in later antiquity, um, when the games start to change a little bit. It's really interesting with the, um, okay, so comparing the artistic evidence from the literary evidence, when you look at the beautiful floor mosaics in North Africa, for example, a lot of them will actually depict that conflict and that tension between humans and animals. You've got these um, oil, olive plantations that are becoming really, really prosperous. And you've got uh, these depictions of everyone in the fields and planting. In the background, you've got these leopards and these lions and these elephants and the, these boar, and they're all coming into conflict with this farmland. And a lot of the poetry that we get around that same time, around the third century and fourth century is talking about how um, the, the land is prosperous now and, and the wild beasts fear their fate here, whilst the amphitheater and all these other buildings that they grow. So they were definitely aware of this symbiotic relation between um, animal depletion and, and the games and um, agricultural prosperity. And um, there are some, uh, some edicts or some laws that come out also in late antiquity and they're around banning hunting. Um, some of them are to do with banning hunting of lions. And it's a little bit um, not too sure if it's to do with um, the, the emperor is trying to reserve those lions for his own games because the numbers are so short. Uh, there's short in supply or is it to do with um, something else? So we do see that dialogue becoming a little bit um, uh, larger and more vocal in late antiquity. Also, when we start to see the animals um, the interactions are changing a little bit. So animals are not necessarily being hunted. They're, they're being provoked and they're being spared for another day. And that is also a little bit of a reflection of potentially species depletion in um, that respect. Catherine, can I piggyback on that and ask another short question, which is, were there any, was it an awareness of this depletion of animals for hunting and were there any attempts perhaps to have say breeding programs captive breeding programs to maintain a population rather than simply go and hunt animals and import them from from um, from abroad i wish we had the evidence um for that unfortunately all of that really juicy evidence that i'd love to have to do with animal husbandry and training the animals uh, and how they were training them whether they were training them how they were breeding them that is, um, a lot of that is not present. We don't have that evidence. 
but certainly, um, I mean, certain species do well in captivity. Um, ostrich, for example, they, the Romans almost certainly had ostrich farms around Italy. Um, they were quite easy to, to breed in captivity. Um, and so with the big cats, it, it is challenging because a lot of these, for example, lions, they are born blind. Um, they remain with their mum for about uh, two years and they rely on her in order to learn how to hunt and behave the way that the Romans may have wanted the lion to behave in the arena. So the captive situation, you know, is at the best for what they want to do in the arena. So it's tricky. I, I wish we had more evidence. We do have evidence for these private uh, imperial um, enclosures, which are called vivaria. Um, so we know that animals were kept there before they went to the games. Potentially, that's where they may have been bred. That's may maybe where they were trained if they were used for these um, less agonistic interactions. Um, but I just wish we had more evidence for that. Yeah. Uh, just to piggyback off that really quickly, Catherine. I'm curious, uh, this isn't my area of focus at all, but I remember reading somewhere that there's some decent sources when it comes to breeding programs and also just depletion of basically elephants, especially like North African elephants, just because they were so frequently used in warfare during the entire Hellenistic age. Sorry, are you, sorry, it's, um, Aiden, are you asking about were they breeding elephants because of the warfare, their use in warfare? Oh, I was more just curious. So, like, does that continue on at all, or are, is there evidence for like people realizing that these elephants are now very, very scarce by the imperial period? Um, yeah, ele elephants are a really interesting one because the Romans tried to stay clear of using them for warfare, and the ones that we do see when they are brought into the arena and the amphitheater, they are, you know, captive. Um, you know, they're, they're war captives essentially. Um, Elephants, yeah, they're a tricky one. You've also got to think about the logistics of getting them over. So um, we start, we see a lot of these elephant numbers, particularly in the Republic, when they were encountering war elephants, um, and then late antiquity, not as much as some of the others. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. I have, I have three questions lined up. Margaret, I think, was first in the chat function, and then I have Brian and Lisa with their hands raised. Um, so I'll, I'll pass over to Margaret since she's been waiting for a few moments. Uh, I'd be interested to hear if, how Anika and or Sarah integrate Africana African studies with teaching classics. I'm also curious about whether Sarah uses Egyptian sources in teaching Cleopatra and whether indigenous perspectives and multivocality can also help in combating racist thinking. I don't know who wants to go first or how you want to balance the answer. <laughs> happy to go first. Uh, thanks for the question, Margaret. So um, I do use some Egyptian sources in my Cleopatra class. Um, and I'm very upfront with my students, like from the first day that um, I'm trained in classics and not in Egyptology. And so I feel rather limited in my ability to teach Egyptian sources. Um, so we, we only use like a handful of, of, um, of sources, um, uh, an inscription on something known as the Bukhis Stele that describes this um, religious ritual that um, Cleopatra participated in um, early in her reign. Um, the um, enormous uh, monumental uh, relief sculpt sculpture at Dendera is another one that we look at, um, as well as a, um, a sculpture buff um, that's located at the Royal Museum, um, the Royal Ontario Mu Museum. Um, and I, um, I really appreciated in Margaret's talk um, the focus on like having students think about Egypt as like a living land, you know, with living people in it. Um, and the only thing I have done so far to sort of help with that um, perspective in my class is I have them watch this video um, produced by the Royal Ontario Museum about this sculpture bust and sort of where it comes from that just shows um, a, some scenes of just like a street in Alexandria with people just walking around, you know, living their lives. Um, so um, I, it's an area that I feel I'm always trying to, to grow in and develop my own skill set um, to, to bring to the class. And, 
um, the, the best I've been able to do so far is really just to be up front about like, I'm very highly qualified to teach the sources from Plutarch and, um, and Horace and, you know, all of these, these Greeks and Romans. Um, but I, I am sort of low on the skill set required to bring in um, more um, Egyptian sources. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, pass the baton to Anika. For, for me, um, I'm gonna just go a little bit back so I could tell you how much this was a personal mission. I grew up going to predominantly white schools where we were not taught any form of black history or African history. And so you grow up thinking history is not your history. And so um, I was very determined to not start with slavery or black people because typically when we think about classics in America, we'll think about the black people who were reading it while enslaved, but that's still starting about just talking about black people as slaves. And, and, and slavery is actually not even really our heritage. It's just something bad that happened to us. Our heritage starts in Africa when we are the builders of the Egypt, of the uh, pyramids, you know, we were the big, uh, even Euclid's elements will cite, hey, I got this thought from the, from the Egyptians. Um, and so what I did, instead of starting in America, I started in ancient Africa for this classics program, sorry. Um, and so I, um, where was I going? Um, so I started in Africa and I started out talking about um, all the different ancient African civilizations that intersect with ancient Greece and Rome. And so I'm using an ancient Greece, Greek or Roman text, looking for the Ethiopians, looking for the Egyptians, looking for the word Kush, and seeing what this ancient Greek or Roman historian has said about them. And then we're pulling out the maps and then we're using documentaries and other writings, the work of Frank Snowden, just to kind of, you know, untangle it so we could figure out our place. And we, we're, we're coming to understand that the map of Africa of ancient times looks very different from the map of Africa of our time and just un untangling the, um, the misunderstanding of Africa. And, um, and seeing exactly where we're placed in all of these stories and who we were. Also understanding that Ethiopia is not um, like what we just think about it today. It was, a, it was an empire. It covered massive amounts of land. E Egypt covered ma massive amounts of lands in Africa. Kush, you know, which are synonymous. So we look at that and then, then we start from there and we slowly work our way up. So it's almost like I'm saying, we're telling the story of ancient Greece and Rome, including the black narrative, not segregated. Hey, this month we're going to talk about ancient African civilizations, but we're still teaching classics, but we're teaching it so that whenever we see the word Kush or Ethiopia or Egypt or, or we mention, you see, oh, with dark skin or woolly hair, like we're, oh, that's us. There you go. Right there in that narrative, right there in that myth. Um, and then, and we continue to teach the story as it is, not trying to make it something that it's not, but the ancient writers did not exclude us. They did not exclude diversity. Even, even, we even did a lesson on um, Cyrus um, because that's Middle East, you know, and, and so it's not even just about Black people. It's talking about making sure we're being intentional about teaching all of the diversity that intersects in that space and then continuing to tell the story. And so at the end of the class, we just finished our last real week of school. They have this real beautiful image of ancient Greece and Rome, the study of classics as including them and them being in positions of power and beauty and prosperity. Um, and we're reading the plays of Terence um, and how that all connects with Hannibal. Hello, like, why are we not talking about Hannibal in classics? You know, so, um, and so he's, that's all a part of the narrative, not separate over here. Cause when we teach it separate, we, we, we perpetuate the division in our society. Like if we teach in a way, in a, in, a, in a spirit of unity, where we show our intersections, I think, it creates a new generation of people that can visualize us as connected. So that's me. No, thank you very much. So it's uh, really great to hear your perspectives. I think we all have more to do on um, 
kind of being more interdisciplinary and to be able to to draw on sources that we're not necessarily used to and comfortable with. And um, I know that that's an issue in Egyptology as well, that we haven't um, been as open as we could have been to um, using African studies, to using classical sources. I think a lot of Egyptologists um, kind of come from a perspective of like, well, If we can see how much Herodotus also got wrong. And um, so then we, we come with a bit of a pre- prejudice against um, seeing Egypt through classical sources. Um, so, um, but I think just um, being open to actually comparing um, and, and using those different sources. Um, I was gonna add as well, there's um, been like some amazing work done on Uh, medieval Egyptian scholars studying um, Cleopatra and like what they wrote about her. And it's just uh, uh, absolutely, um, so Okasha El Dali is like um, a particular uh, scholar who's worked on this, Uh, but I'm sure there's others. And it's so fascinating to see such a different image of Cleopatra, like who's always sort of generally portrayed in terms of her relationship with, with you know the, with Rome and um, mm-hmm. she's presented as a scholar as a scientist a chemist her you know as comp- uh, innovative um, in terms of her knowledge um, and it's just kind of you know none of this sort of, of Hollywood sort of style of, uh, way that she's pictured um, you know and it's really interesting even now today to listen to how Um, both what, you know, say Cleopatra means to African-American audiences, to Egyptian audiences, uh, you know, and not just, um, you know, whether, uh, well, was she white? Was she black? Um, Maybe it's a lot more complicated (laughs) than that. Um, And uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, considering those um, a multitude of perspectives and how we, uh, nothing is really um, just black or white. So um, if we can consider questions Mm -hmm. beyond that as well, um, I think it's, yeah. Uh, Can I say something? Oh, sorry. (laughs) I like what you just said. I'm sorry, but when you said it's, not just black and white, because that's not even used back then. The word white, we don't even, they don't even say that back then. Yeah. And black yeah. is not even thought of like what we think of today. I mean, a lot of the words like the word kush means black, you know, I mean, I think Ethiopia means and dark skin. Doesn't, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, you know, the way we think about black and white, that immediately sets up yeah. a division, but that's not even what's going on in the ancient times. I'm not trying to make ancient times to be out this perfect heavenly space where everybody's just all, you know, hunky-dory and stuff, but I'm saying that it's not what we're dealing with, you know? And even when we talk about Egypt, um, when we talk about Egypt or or North Africa versus, you know, Sub-Saharan and all that, that's not even going on back then. You know, we there are certain things that have been put in place by uh, by our modern time that sets up a division as if it, that's what it was in ancient times. And exactly. Africa was just yeah. Africa, you know? It was yes. just... No, I've just been reading um, a book right now too, in which they're trying to look at populations that lived on the border of, well, the border of Egypt and uh, Sudan, which was again, changing all the time and trying to define people as well. The, these people were, um, you know, Mediterranean, um, which uh, I think is a coded word for something else. And these people were, <laughs> were Nubian. Um, and it's like, well, of course, these populations were interacting and like there was movement all the time. It's, it's these definitions are, are unhelpful. Yes. Oh my gosh. I could go on and on, but I'm, I'm about to be like Caroline. I'll keep talking because I'm so passionate about this. She was like, I'll be quiet. Okay. okay and can move on to some. Uh, Brian has hand up, then Lisa, and then I have a question from uh, Zoe in the, the chat. Hey, I I can't see myself. Can you see me or? Well, uh, we can hear you. I've just asked you to start your video. There we go. Right. Now we can see you. Uh, I had a, a question. Uh, I suppose mostly for uh, for Sarah, but in, in a way, it's more more general. I, I was uh, struck uh, as, and with. Uh, and Ike as well. Uh, the the whole subject of uh, of racism is just obviously one of the the, the major issues that the, the discipline has to uh, uh, face 
in America and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and that interesting um, distinction Sarah made between text and material culture and the discipline, the academic discipline of, uh, of, of classics. Um, I, I think I wrote down, Sarah, that you said classics as an academic discipline is, is racist to the core. Um, and I suppose my question is really, to what extent is the discipline of, of classics compromised, not just in the United States? In, in Ireland, we, uh, we certainly have uh, racism. We haven't really had an opportunity for much color-based racism. Uh, we are certainly have any amount of capacity for it, I'm afraid. But uh, in Ireland, I, I suspect our, our, our problem the complicity of classics is with uh, colonialism. Uh, not that Ireland was a colonial or a colonializing country or occasional agents of uh, colonialism, uh, but more in the interpretation of, of the classics. I mean, we, we still think of Alexander the Great as uh, Shane will know, I, I, I think Alexander the Great was a, a murderous psychopath with a drink problem. Uh, he brought mayhem, death and destruction to just about millions of people from Greece to India. I, I, I don't admire him at all, but the interpretation of classical scholarship, of, of empire, of colonialism, I think deeply compromises us. So I, I suppose my question is really, uh, how is the discipline, uh, what, what exactly you mean racist to the core uh, and does that extend to the whole discipline? Uh, or uh, it, 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 obviously it's a, a, a sensitive issue, but uh, it is one that we we have to confront. Thank you so much for your question, Brian. So um, from my um, admittedly limited perspective, I believe that classics is compromised to the extent that um, classicists in position of, of influence um, with decision-making capacities, um, faculty on um, admissions committees, hiring committees, curriculum development committees are not willing to interrogate their own positionality um, as, as white people in position of power and who are not willing, to the extent that they are not willing to um, to ask these hard questions about the discipline, what Anika is describing about how um, people of color have been um, completely ignored in the texts who are in fact there, um, the extent to which um, the, the Greek and Roman past has been completely whitewashed in, um, um, in the way it's been taught and the way the discipline has been constructed. I mean, there's, I, I think I, I said something along these lines in the talk, but um, I, I personally just accept at, as a fact of life that all institutions in this country that um, are controlled by white people um, are going to be um, constituted on a basis of systemic racism. And um, systemic racism, um, in case anyone's not familiar with the term, means that um, institutions are structured in ways that are racist, even if the people within those institutions do not necessarily hold malicious prejudices against people of color. Um, the way the systems function are going to have a racist outcome regardless of any particular beliefs of people located throughout that system. Um, and I think that the whole of of the academy in the United States has a serious systemic racism problem. The whole of our education system has these kinds of problems. So in some respects, classics is not different from these kind of bigger problems where um, people with, with certain kinds of privilege, so particularly white people, particularly the wealthier, are sort of funneled upward and, and everyone else is sort of pushed downward. Um, and so it's not a coincidence that when you look at like sort of who's on the faculty, um, who has has tenure, you know, at at um, in classics departments, it's like overwhelmingly white um, and rather more male than female. You know, like all of these systems of oppressions kind of inter intersect um, to give us the system that we have. Um, and I don't think that the case is any less 
hopeless than um, you know kind of any other um, case of, of, of systemic racism. There are people who are doing the work to try to to make the, the kinds of changes that are going to be really helpful, um, but there are also too many people who are resisting this kind of work and this kind of change. Yeah, so I think that um, I, I I think that for for many classics departments, and I, I realize I'm kind of privileging the the university over other other places where classics are being taught um, in the way I'm describing it, because this is more what I'm familiar with. Um, I, I do think that there are too many classicists who are really our own worst enemies um, in this in this fight. Um, I think there's such a sense for many professional classicists that um, we're kind of passing on a tradition in which we were trained, but there are some real problems with that tradition. And um, I, um, I, I love so much Anika's approach to teaching these texts. Like I think it absolutely can be done that we can teach these texts in a way that is actually positive. And um, again, like part of the solution, um, not just text, all of the materials. Um, but if we're not even willing to consider that the way we've been doing these things is part of the problem, then we're never gonna, we're never gonna make any progress. Okay, great. Uh, I, I know that we're, we're almost out of time, but I thought we could perhaps have one last question to bring in a couple of the other uh, speakers on the panel. Zoe has been answering questions in the chat function on the commerciality of sports in the ancient world, but she also had a question for George. Shall I read it out, Zoe? Would you like to present it yourself? Sure, yeah. I was just curious about sort of the, the recent phenomenon of these astrology apps, because I think that they've been becoming more and more trendy now. Um, and I, I, it's just an open-ended question about what your thoughts were on those as a class assistant, if you think that they're like helping to bring people into this world or if they're disconnecting us more, more so. Uh, thank you very much for, for the questions. So uh, no, I haven't used them, uh, although I'm aware that they exist. Um, like as a class assist, I don't believe that they really help uh, because uh, many people do not know that the origins of today's astrology are rooted in, in, in classical Rome, Greece, and even, even back in Babylonia and Mesopotamia, and uh, the Egyptians have uh, their contribution as well. Um, so from that point of view, I don't believe it really helps. So the constellations themselves are based on, on most of them on classical myths, but still, I don't believe that today, like the, the middle, the average person that would use an application like that would do that in order to, to, to know what's happening or what's the basis uh, of these things are or the myths behind it, but probably more like a mundane thing of, okay, what should I do today? Uh, is this going to be uh, a good day for my job? So from that point of view, they are nonsense. But thank you for, for the question. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm aware that we have run a minute or two over, but without taking too much time from the, the tea break, I, I would like to abuse my privileges as chair to ask a, ask a question, just very briefly of, of Mary Louise, who um, I, I don't think has received any questions so far, but I was gonna ask you to, to, to what extent Gesner's approaches to pedagogy might have prompted others to follow that example how much was his you know what was his lasting influence in this from the 18th century and beyond okay thank you very much well um of course um first um i think um it well be, why do i treat or why do i deal with his pedagogy well the, the point about it is that um we have a crisis also today and we have there, there was a certain investigation of, um, of um, how do students, how students understand Latin texts and they do not understand them by translating them, but, the, but rather by decoding them. And so we need mental representations. So just to put this uh, structure into a nutshell. And so I wanted to go back and understand, okay, when did all this start and the translation and the justification and the arguments of, um, of reading a lot and of understanding as well and um, 
how can we include um, basically a, a, a great canon and how can we understand as much as possible and as and consequently also as read as much as possible. So, um, and that's why um, Gessner, he was, of course, he has become very known as a, a typical neo-humanist. Of course, this was also very exclusive, very white generally. And, um, but it's, but you also find this just in the, um, for example, in the history of the scientists and that um, there's also a certain canon. Talking about neo-humanism means to talk about, um, uh, starting with Gessner, just this part. Um, and the methods, well, he himself, he had a certain impact, for example, on the philanthropists and also on, um, he started this movement, this uh, so-called neo-humanistic movement without though, calling it like this. But um, they tried to enhance and to stimulate and to motivate um, um, the reading product, or well, the production of Latin to speak and they wanted to use it. So, um, and to, they wanted to use it to understand it much better and much more fluently. And um, this might be, well, we could once may perhaps um, find a way to link this to the inclusion of different authors or why did they generally um, want to read only these authors? Because of course, of course in the 18th century, um, they, they also, they were struggling with uh, keeping the classics alive because of this psychism. There was this crisis and um, they, all the scholars, they had a bad reputation because it was fruitless and it was vain. So they tried to remove this and to get into touch with others and with international scholars. And um, well, there are many points, but um, I think the, well, Yes, and nonetheless, the grammar books, and maybe you are interested if you want to investigate into this, for example, uh, the focus on grammar that um, he was uh, fighting, it was still very strong. And it was also in Germany that, for example, you know, that uh, the philology um, was very um, um, influential because of the grammar translation method and the grammar generally, but actually he wanted to go away from this. Nonetheless, it was, the, the, the grammarians were stronger. And so it, it is really, um, well, and still today we have this focus on the grammar. So it is still um, hard to understand many texts. And this is a basic problem that's, which has just not stopped. So um, we, we could see what we can learn from someone there and what, 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 of course, what we can exclude and to see, okay, he influenced the philanthropists and they also wanted to include women up to a certain point, for example. Also, Gerner, he taught his daughter, but there are different aspects about it. I'm sorry if it was too long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Ralph has, uh, has asked for, for, for one last question for Aiden, and I think then we'll, we'll tie things up. Thank you. I think I will uh, defer my question because it's largely covered in the one that Alex Imri asked in the chat. So um, if Aidan, you are willing to uh, answer this one, um, Alex asked that he was interested in the way that uh, near contemporary traditions framed Washington as a classical Plutarchan mode. Um, he's curious um, as to what similar qualities surviving into modern um, presentations of the founding fathers um, up to now. Is the modern American reception of these people still inherently classical? Or has it veered away into a different frame of reference? Um, part of the question I was going to ask is particularly how did this very Plutarchan mode of framing Washington as almost a demigod or in reference to classical heroes and demigods fit in with the um, religious revival and particularly Christian nationalism and conservatism um, in American politics in uh, um, preceding decades and centuries? Uh, I certainly think that in terms of especially in conservative circles, the framing of the constitution as a semi-magical document pairs well with the idea of like above reproach founding fathers. At the same time though, we've obviously seen a very strong countervailing force when it comes to actually looking at the history of some of these founding figures. I think no more so than Jefferson has been like very strongly toppled from a perch of being viewed as the writer of the Declaration of Independence to a horrible slave owner. Uh, at the same time though, I think there is a hunger in a certain extent to have these sorts of, I don't know, more romantic 
great whatever figures of history, which is seen very explicitly in how popular a show like Hamilton can be. The fact that we have a show in which pitch that like I think has gone on for five, six years now on Broadway about a, the first treasury secretary of the United States, like that should not be something that's a popular topic. And yet it is somehow. So I think people do want to see these historic figures in a more romantic and kind of like, even if it's a still humanized light, a one that they can actually admire and try to emulate rather than simply cast down and denigrate. All right, thank you very much. I think we've, we've gone over time, so I might draw a uh, draw to a close uh, an excellent panel of presentations and also an excellent panel of discussion as well. And thank each and every one of our speakers and respondents uh, uh, today. And perhaps hand over now to one of the organizers with more information on um, the break in the next panel. Hi everyone, thank you so much for that fascinating discussion. A few questions came in for the speakers there. That chat is open to reply to the, respond to those questions at your leisure. We are now gonna take a 15 minute break, go get caffeinated. We are back with our keynote um, lecture from Professor Brian McGing. So please enjoy the break. And like I said, at your leisure, respond to those questions and discussion points in the chat. And thank you all, see you soon. <laughs>